The Chronic Illness Therapist podcast is meant to be a place where people with chronic illnesses can come to feel heard, seen, and safe while listening to mental health therapists and other medical professionals talk about the realities of treating difficult conditions. This might be a new concept for you, one in which you never have to worry about someone inferring that it's all in your head. We dive deep into the human side of treating complex medical conditions and help you find professionals that leave you feeling hopeful for the future. I hope you love what you learned here, and please consider leaving a review or sharing this podcast with someone you love. This podcast is meant for educational purposes only. For specific questions related to your unique circumstances, please contact a licensed medical professional in your state of residence. Sandra Mueller is a licensed physical therapist and integrative nutritionist in Encinitas, California. She specializes in pelvic health and complex pelvic pain conditions. She approaches care for these individuals through an integrative approach and is currently the clinical director at Pelvic Health and Rehabilitation Center in Encinitas, California. She's also the director of internal and external education, helping to provide mentorship and training within the company, as well as content development and creation for both internal and external education. She hosts the Endometriosis Unplugged podcast with I Care Better, embodying her commitment to a comprehensive patient-centered care model. She's been an invited guest speaker at several conferences and volunteers on the Scientific Committee for the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. Sandra is a dedicated professional advancing pelvic health through an integrative and creative lens. And I'm really excited for our conversation today, which is filled with nuance and objectivity and I just found it really really insightful and I hope that you will too. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to my audience and um yeah yeah well thank you for inviting me and Anna has spoken wonders about you. So my name is Jandra Mueller and I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist and I also have my master's of uh, in integrative health and nutrition. And that came a little bit after my introduction into pelvic pain, really, and my own story of what was helpful, what was not helpful. And I really saw it as a larger part of pelvic pain for a number of reasons, um, just the lack of education around more natural therapies or things that can help minimize symptoms or address GI issues that we know can manifest or be involved with these diagnoses. And there's often a limit that conventional medicine can offer if it's not medications or maybe mindfulness. And so it's kind of addressing it in a more holistic way. Yeah. And you have a book, Pelvic Pain Explained. That's not my book. That's not my book. So okay. the company I work for, I, I work at the Pelvic Health and Rehabilitation Center, and I'm the, our clinic director here in Encinitas. We have 11 locations, actually. Pretty small company, but we have little clinics throughout, mostly on the East Coast and West Coast. And then we just opened our first in Ohio. And so Stephanie and Liz are the co-founders of PHRC, and they wrote the book Pelvic Pain Explained. Okay, okay. I see it in your signature. Um but that makes much more sense now. Um, okay. But it's a great so book. <laughs> yeah, we both should get it. Um, tell me then maybe a little bit about what kind of clients, um, patients you typically see. What, um, you know, pelvic pain is obviously, it's broad and there's a bunch of different diagnoses, but do you kind of work from a diagnosis lens or do you work more like pain is pain and, and kind of symptom wise you just go with that or you tell me a little bit about your philosophy about how you work with your patients sure that's a great question so i we see all pelvic health conditions so all genders uh male female and that can include of course those that are born or assigned female at birth assigned male at birth but also those undergoing gender affirming care whether that's preoperative with top surgery, bottom surgery, we see a lot of people post uh, post neo-vagina because of the dilator recommendations and things like that. But I would say at our clinic, 
we really hone in on the complex pelvic pain cases just because that's where our training is. And my my bosses, Steph and Liz, they kind of started out in a different, unique way than most pelvic PTs get started, where they were introduced directly into pain conditions and worked with a doctor directly. Whereas most of the time, if you're interested in pelvic health, you undergo the first class, the second class, and it's a lot of what we consider low tone disorders, so weakness. So most people that know pelvic health or what that is, they associate it automatically with incontinence, uh, whether that's urinary or fecal, and kind of in the postpartum or peripartum population or the elderly, and so in prolapse as well. But pelvic health is kind of two things. It can be those disorders, but then you have high tone or pelvic pain, pelvic floor dysfunction, which could kind of mean both things. And a lot of times those mask as a diagnosis. And so people aren't necessarily understanding that there's a muscular component as the main factor or just as a resulting factor of the disease, like endometriosis or interstitial cystitis. So we hear that and we think medical, I need to go to a doctor. So it can be both. And usually with those types of conditions, it really involves a multidisciplinary approach. Sometimes the diagnosis is important. Sometimes it's just there because it's a label for symptoms. And so to answer your question a little bit more about, do we go based off a of diagnosis or pain is pain? It's a mix of all of that. So I would say a lot of people that come in and say, I have vaginismus, I'm throwing that diagnosis out the window because historically, yes, it that has been what we call vaginal spasm or tightness, un, inability to be penetrated essentially, whether that's with a speculum or inserting a tampon or penis and vagina sex. And it it is more than that. And there's usually a cause. There is truly those with vaginismus, but that is quite rare. It's just historically been misdiagnosed. And one of the longest diagnoses we've actually known about with the least amount of change in either diagnostic criteria or treatment options. What do you do? What's your first um, line of action when someone comes in saying, I have vaginismus? How do you start to assess for what actually needs to happen with them? Yeah, I, I consider first the age and, and some of the background. So I ask a really detailed history. And I think if you really listen, they're going to give you the answers, right? So if that person says, you know, I was diagnosed with this and for my entire life, I've not been able to do this. It's really painful. I'll ask about, you know, okay, when you first started your period, for example, usually people pick it up with the, with the use of a tampon. I'll ask them how that experience was and if they've ever been on birth control pills, because that's another thing that might start early on because of painful periods. And so I'm thinking in the diagnosis lens of, okay, this might be not be vaginismus, but it might be something called vestibulodynia, which essentially is surrounding the opening of the vagina. Inside of the labia, you have this tissue and it's highly sensitive to hormone uh, changes. So birth control pills, can cause irritation, inflammation, low hormones there. But there's also other types where it's impacting nerves and mast cells, and there's a congenital form of it, and then there's an acquired form. So most of the time, it's one of those. And so you can't enter the vagina without kind of hitting the vestibule. So just like if your hand was to touch a hot stove, you would pull away Anytime that that tissue is touched, which it's going to be pretty much always with anything going in, your muscles are going to react and spasm in reaction to that pain. So that's something I look for. And you can do a vulvar exam before you even insert. You can look for changes. You can get a good history. Maybe they've never been on birth control. They've had this for so long. And that I usually think, okay, this might be a neuroproliferative situation. They have a positive Q-tip test. There are findings. It's just most people don't look for them or know that they can test for that just in their exam. You know, you go to your OB and they're interested in your cervix and your uterus and they blow past all the skin, which can be so telling. What are some of the causes? What are some of the causes of that issue? So for 
the hormonal side of things, anything that suppresses your hormones or puts you in like a hypoestrogenic state. So that might be the use of birth control pills or systemic birth control like the Nuva ring. Some of the progestin only ones, not so much IUDs, no. But if but and some pills are worse than others in creating this. And there is a genetic component because it's not just the lack of hormone. It also changes the receptor of the cell. So like the lock and key and there's no lock, those don't fit anymore. There's times when you're breastfeeding that you don't have a period because it's benefiting you because you're taking care of another baby. Your body is essentially, you know, keeping this other human alive. So your body cannot take on more load of getting pregnant again. So the breastfeeding, you know, in that time period, some may actually be on a birth control pill in to ensure that they don't get pregnant because your period may start up or they've had years of being on it prior to. So that compounds it. And then later in life, as we start to get into perimenopause and menopause, that's a natural aging and our hormones naturally go down. And so that's another opportunity where that might happen. If you take different medications aside from birth control pills, there's been some associations with Accutane or spironolactone for acne. There's also been things like, you know, these therapies that are used for treating, which is not a treatment, uh, for endometriosis like Orlissa, Lupron that just shut it down and kind of make you go into menopause or cancer treatment drugs that suppress hormones for estrogen-related cancers. So anything that suppresses hormones potentially may result in this. Then aside from the hormone, that. yeah. I, yeah, I'm curious if there are instances in which the suppression of the hormone from something like a birth control pill actually benefits someone's system. So there can be benefits of these, of these medications for sure. They just may not come without side effects. Yeah, I should, I should rephrase that. Um, so I had a friend years ago say that her doctor told her that her, like, her endometriosis basically would have been a lot worse if she wasn't on birth control all these years. And I had never heard that. I've kind of only heard more like what you're saying right now. So I'm just curious if there's, if, th if that is a part of this conversation that, that deserves time and space that is a great observation and yes so birth control pills can help symptom management with endometriosis and the it's kind of up in the air research wise there is some thought that maybe there's some suppression it's probably best used post-surgery once it's already there it's not going to take away those lesions but there is some thought in using a specific type post-surgery to sort of delay the time between surgeries so I am kind of like your friend where at 13, I was having these crazy pain episodes, probably more around ovulation. And I think the birth control pill, though it caused me all these other issues, I actually do think it helped my, my symptoms of endometriosis until later in life. So the use of it to manage symptoms is very different than the causes or side effects that it still may come with. So this population, those with endo that do benefit from utilizing the birth control pill, and they do have better pain management, it's not taking away the endo, but if it's also causing vestibulodynia and painful sex, treating the endo may not tr treat the painful sex that the birth control pill caused, right? But that might be an indication that you say, okay, this is why we need to really get the lesions addressed and get a good excision surgery so that you don't have to rely on the pill to manage your symptoms. We can get you off of that. We can get you to the specialist and get everything more optimized in the vulvar region so that you're also not having painful sex. Got it. Thanks for addressing that. Yeah. So you and then we kind of go into the other form yeah. is, yeah, n the neuroproliferative form. When you're born with it, there there's some thought that maybe you're not actually born with it, but maybe there's chemicals in some of these diaper rash creams um, that we know can convert somebody from, you know, normal life to acquired, meaning you didn't have it at the onset of periods, the first tampon use. You may have had normal sex that was not painful, but then something happened like an irritant. So monostat has been correlated highly as one of the most common 
topical medications that can cause it almost like an allergic reaction that then proliferate these mast cells and nerve endings. And it we don't have good treatments aside from surgery to remove that area to calm that down and revert it. So there is some thought now and there's some some women that are that have had this and they are interested in researching more about the diaper creams and some of these other products that are used. And maybe it wasn't there when they were born, but maybe the use of those products over and over and their genetics specifically did convert, but it's not showing up until they tried to insert something into the vagina. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you for addressing that. Um, what, so some of the treatment then is, um, maybe, maybe we can go to that part next. Like, how do you kind of work through, you've made this assessment and, and what comes next usually? Yeah. So for all pelvic pain, I'm looking for kind of two main things. What's causing the pain and why, right? So you know, you ha- your goals as a patient, because also we need to consider their goals too. I might think of these five other things that is not relative to them. And this comes in to talk about those that are not in heterosexual relationships. So penis and vagina sex is not something that they care about. They still may need to undergo pap smears and all that. And so there is some goals around that, but their interest is not to improve this because of that activity, which is so often assumed by providers you know, this is this is your goal. And sometimes it's not. So we incorporate that into their care plan. Um, it doesn't always change how I would approach it uh, in the end, but sometimes it does. And so I'm looking for what's generating the pain and why. So going through that history, going through my evaluation, and then the treatment plan oftentimes for these folks is a multidisciplinary approach. So the muscles are almost always involved, but is the muscle secondary to something else going on that needs to be treated? And then we can really make some changes in the muscles. If they've gone years trying to find a diagnosis, they've been to PT, they've had all these painful exams, that might be a little bit more tricky and it might take more time than somebody who happened to get to the right doctor the first time, does not have a lot of medical trauma. There may be less PT work once that tissue is better or that nerve is calmed down with an injection or medication or they had an endo excision surgery. So it's kind of looking at their findings and then better determining, you know, how do we approach this? Can we start with the PT alongside these interventions or do we need to get you to the right people, get this a little bit managed and then reassess the musculoskeletal piece of it? And Something just came to mind. Um, the word this myofascial release has been kind of, I think, really trending lately. Um, is that what you're essentially talking about, or is that something different than what you do? Yeah, that is definitely part of what we are doing, whether that and it's external and internal. And myofascial release is sort of a catch all term because there's so many ways to do that. There's ways where it's very light touch and almost like visceral manipulation types type things where you're really honing in on the nervous system and optimizing the body's own way. There's very gentle myofascial release techniques. We utilize one that's like skin rolling, which can actually be kind of painful. You know, there's a whole debate in PT. PT shouldn't be painful. It should feel therapeutic. It may not always be comfortable, but your patient shouldn't be sitting there and guarding and tensing as you're doing this. That's not productive, but it may not feel comfortable, but you want your patient to feel like, oh, that was beneficial. While it might have been uncomfortable during the treatment, I actually feel a lot better and I'm seeing changes. Got it. Um, yeah, I'm even thinking about um yeah, another friend, years and years, like she she has a um a tongue tie and you know, had always had this tongue tie, very, very um and like severe tongue tie and also had a trouble with uh, you know first tampon things of that nature and um so just also thinking about the way everything connects in our body um yeah thoughts on that like from a tongue tie to pelvic pain the feet for issues. sure it's so interesting because i've had a few patients that 
that was a huge part. And I can't speak so much. I'm not as knowledgeable about tongue ties per se, but I will say the few patients that I've honed in on that. And the first time I ever actually, my awareness was brought to that was a patient I was seeing. She was more postpartum, having some pelvic pain, but there was a lot of other things going on, you know, foot mechanics and hip, and she was a runner. And there was just something that wasn't quite fitting or changing to the degree I would have expected. And her baby actually was having some issues feeding. And so they got evaluated and that doctor had said, you know, it's oftentimes genetic. And so you you may have one, your husband may have one, it might be somewhere. And sure enough, she actually ended up having a pretty severe one and underwent the release. And it was really interesting to see what she reported that was different, just her whole body felt a little bit more relaxed. And I've ha- since had two others, very much the same thing. I will say it's probably not the thing that without me knowing more about it, I would go directly to. But in these cases, you know, they really did do everything and they did get better, but there was this plateau and it really made a difference in addressing it. I like the way that you worded that, like they were doing everything and there was there everything that, you know, you were working on them with and then there was um, improvement and there was just still something. I think my clients get hung up on that quite a lot. Um, I know I have in the past too, but I think that's why we kind of, we do talk about having an interdisciplinary team and, but it's hard. It's hard to find all the right people who might know about tongue ties versus like, you know, just the fascia in general or something like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or things that are just now coming to light. Um, Thankfully, more and more practitioners are really like learning and, and staying up to date, but it really does take a team. Um, yeah. And at the same time, you kind of like can't jump around too, too much from practitioner to practitioner because then it gets confusing. Whereas yeah. if you, you know, you're working with just what you're doing and it's like, we've done everything. Now you can find that missing link a little bit more clearly, I think, than I can exactly. like, I'm going to PT, I'm going here, I'm going there, I'm going there. Yeah. Yeah. You have to, you have to give some things time and what the 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 fun thing about my job but also can be frustrating is you know I'm not doing something to you this is an interactive process where I'm going to try the things that I know but in reality if we keep going down that path it's really based on your response to it and if you're not responding to the tools I have we need to modify we need to bring in other people I need to shift gear and use some other tools that might not be my primary ones that I know work. And so PT really is this ongoing assessment and reevaluation between each each session too. And sometimes, yeah, and my plan is for the next three, four visits, we're going to work in this area. We should see these changes. But if that's not doing it, we got to switch gears. And I think some some of the practices of PT in the past have been very much like here's and public PT is a little bit different, but in general have been you go to your PT to get evaluated and then you might see whoever is there or a PTA or a PT aide. And this is talking about all PT in general. And pelvic is a little bit different. We get to see our patients more one on one and they don't shift around. But that's not always true for everything. And I just don't like that approach of handing off because I need to know how they responded to know if I need to modify it not just create a plan for 12 visits and then reassess then. No, it's a constant reassessment. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. Um, And unfortunately, the how you just described is, is kind of what a lot of patients um, receive. The, not only do they also kind of jump themselves around from practitioner to practitioner, but then also within a, even within a, well, one clinic, you know, might be like, oh, you need to go to this side yeah. or that side. Um. I yeah even my own pelvic floor PT like I remember when I first started with her they were trying to decide like oh well if you're dealing more with jaw stuff then like you might have to go to the other side of like with the ortho guys and then she was like you know but it it was so confusing to me because I was like that feels so separated it feels so luckily I've only been I've been able to just work with her and it's been really great but um it can be really confusing Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some, I'm curious, uh, like coping mechanisms or um, things that you see people, 
it could be emotionally, but also just like physical coping mechanisms that you see a lot of people engage in that maybe make pelvic pain worse or something like that, like bracing or, um, you know, some of those kind of those mechanisms that they use to keep themselves safe, but also it's contributing to more pain. I would say bracing is probably the number one thing, right? If we experience pain and the, that guarding reflex is is huge. And so it that's kind of not really in our control whether we're going to have that reaction. But I think it's being mindful of noticing that and then utilizing the breathing techniques or stretching or whatever works for them, whether it's mindfulness or getting into a specific position focusing on their breath. It can be a, a number of things for people. But yes, and that and it doesn't even happen when there's there is pain. It can happen in that I'm getting really anxious about going to this doctor's appointment. It's a new gynecologist. I'm worried about X, Y, and Z, or this is a new PT, or I moved, or what about this long car drive? And so there isn't even pain yet, but there's that those patterns and pathways in the brain that are anticipating that. And so I think working with your PT or a mental health therapist, like especially a mental health therapist for these individuals who have had a lot of that medical trauma, and that's very real, it may not completely min like get rid of your pain, but if you can just lower the threshold by utilizing these techniques, even in the instance where there is pain, you can probably dial that down by honing in to those techniques and practicing them in real time. Yeah, absolutely. That is a big part of, of what we work on, which can be really hard because it feels a lot of times as soon as you start to kind of think about what it is you have to do within your treatment, a lot of um, a lot of times the, the narrative is like, oh, so I'm doing something wrong. I'm hurting myself. And then we kind of work through mm -hmm. that kind of emotional, where that came from and um, how to alleviate that a little bit um, so that you can then engage in these treatments and have a stronger intuition around what's right for you or what's not right for you physically. Because if you're guarded, embraced, and scared the whole time, which again is reasonable given yeah. our histories, um, it does mean our intuition is not being built it's just like there's just fear and that's all we see and when something doesn't need to be feared we're, we're not going to be able to see it so that is a big piece yeah. of what we work on and it's great to talk with patients mental health therapists or other providers in in creating a plan for them too and there's one individual that this is exactly what we did and there was a lot of fear around the doctor's appointments because of the trauma and upcoming surgery. And so their therapist and I kind of spoke about different things. I was actually lucky to be at the procedure, whereas the therapist, it wasn't really appropriate. They couldn't. And so I talked with them and just better understood what are some techniques I can help bring to the table at that time. And we problem solved through many things, you know, being in a medical office and needing to be still for IV insertion can be really triggering for this individual. And so it was, you know, talking with the nurses and just bringing them up to speed on previous things. You know, there might be coming out of anesthesia, there might be this reaction of wanting to move. And to a medical provider and not understanding these individual differences might want to restrain, which is going to make it worse. So talking about, you know, let them move. Here's some safe movements you could do as a patient. You know, there's somebody there with them guiding them through that fidget toys. And we really worked through different calming techniques that could be utilized in that instance. And so that was a really cool dynamic process between both therapists and, and PT and patient involved in what worked for them. Yeah, that's such an important point. I love the anesthesia example because um it's true a lot of times you want to kind of your body and your brain just like comes out of anesthesia and it feels like it's right back to where it was before it went under um and to stifle that movement can be really sometimes damaging psychologically yeah um, maybe physically too yeah yeah what else um does anything else come up for you around like the mind body connection um and i know you mentioned too like uh, your um program and integrative nutrition. So if you want to bring any of that into 
happy to have space for that. Sure. So with the mind-body connection with pelvic pain, one thing I think is really important for anybody listening that has pelvic pain is there is many times where you may have been either told or felt that your provider or somebody trying to help you or even friends, family, colleagues have maybe thought, maybe this is anxiety. And what I want people to know is while there may be some anxiety present in your life from a young age, having pelvic pain does create anxiety in and of itself. And so I think that's really important for people to hear because when you work with people who really truly understand pelvic pain, we understand that anxiety is just a natural part of this. Who wouldn't be anxious when their pelvic pain, which really doesn't, you know, I'm going to switch gears for a second. The example I use is when you strain your hamstring, for example, or when you skin your knee, that doesn't seem very scary to the majority of people. I know what it is. That sucks. I can't do my workout. Oh, the scab is there. The the clothes touching it is irritating. The thing with pelvic pain is that a lot of the times musculoskeletal symptoms in pelvic pain present as urinary bowel sexual difficulties, which are oftentimes like an infection. Do I have cancer? They, they do not present as muscular symptoms, partially because we didn't most people don't even realize there's muscles there. So why am I urinating frequently? How is that a muscle issue? and not a UTI or bladder cancer, you know, from the extreme. And so because we're not aware, we're not taught, we don't talk about it, pudendal nerve is derived from the shamefuls. So it's already like rooted in shame, right? So why would we expect our patients with pelvic pain to not be anxious? Thank you for saying that. (laughs) It it's probably one of the most frustrating things. And it and it's so sad because There is a reason your body is telling you something is off. And this week, you know, we talk a lot about women and women getting dismissed, but it is true for males that have pelvic pain. And just this week, actually, I I had a male patient tell me um, he was saying I had to bring my partner to the doctors because they were really starting to think that this was, you know, and he like made the comment of like, Oh, this guy is kind of nuts. And he said there was a sign at the office that said, listening to your patients will give you your answers or something along those lines. And he's like, okay, I'm telling you that this is going on, but it's because you can't figure it out. It's automatically assumed it's in my head. And that is like what most women or females go through with this. And he, he said, it's not like I want to have this. I do not want to have this. What, like what, in what world would I be making this up? Right, right. That is, that is fascinating. Um, Because usually, yeah, I hear a lot of my female clients are like, yeah, I had to take my husband with me to my appointment because they just don't believe me or, or they listen to him better or which is, so sad, but I, I do think, well, there's obviously a lot of gender issues and stereotypes and things at play here. I also do think it has a lot more to do with a doctor's ego and not being able to answer something than it really does about even how you look. Um, and it's not to dismiss this or invalidate this. I have clients and listeners of the podcast who like feel like they have to dress a certain way to either be believed or heard or seen or not seen in a certain light. And that might also, again, partly be true. But I think when you come in with something that a doctor knows exactly what it is or how to treat, it doesn't matter what you look like. They're going to like, it, it's all about their ego. Yeah. And so uh, learning to be able to sit with the unknown. And I'm also hearing too, like the anxiety, again, like you don't really have anxiety about a pulled hamstring. We know exactly what to do. But when things pre- present confusingly, now no one has answers and we know that answers make us feel more at ease for the most part, which is why most of us with chronic pain and chronic illnesses are researching. And then people tell us not to research because, yeah. you know, we're just putting things in our head and like, no, like these things are happening and I'm trying to find the answer because no one will give it to me. So, yeah. 
And I don't dismiss patients who say, you know, I know that this isn't the best, but on this Reddit thread, I'm like, go for it. Just be aware that you don't know all the details of this case, what they've been through. But yeah, it, they're all tools. Use Dr. Google. And I'm not going to dismiss somebody. If anything, it makes me feel like you are really engaged in your care to go the extra effort and try to figure this out. I have more information and I have training in this. So let's work as a team and put this together because I won't always have all the answers. I, much of the time, I'm just a very curious person. So I like to be like detective. Yes, I agree. I think uh, when clients also bring, even like I'll hear other therapists be like, everyone's got a TikTok diagnosis this these days. And I'm like, yeah, because no one else will give them one. Like now we get to say, here's what the DSM actually says. Like, here's what, you know, here's what the symptoms look like. Let me help you understand it from from what this book says. Not that it's even, that's a whole other podcast episode. Yeah. <laughs> DSM. But if, in a, if a diagnosis is important to a client, which I don't tend to work with it, I tend to work with more like these symptoms and um, kind of more from a explaining why a symptom might show up from a defensive mechanism rather than like you just have this thing. It's not an illness, you know, it's not a. So um, I just think it's really important for clients to be doing their own research and then collaborating with us, yes. like you said, from my knowledge we get to work on this together so you're not just out there fumbling alone you have guidance you have a mentor but you're also doing your work and your your part in it yeah absolutely because wow. they're going to bring something to the table that i may not have thought to ask and i i say you know i know a lot about this from a professional standpoint this is what i do this is what i study i'm looking at it all the time but you know your body. And so together, like I rely on you for the information that can tell me which direction. And then you kind of see, and sometimes just bringing up some things, here's some thoughts, they might connect with something and say, you know what, I forgot. You know, it, five years ago, actually this happened and you start to, okay, now things are fitting because they didn't know that that information was relevant. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it's very helpful. Um, of course, there is like sometimes we do have to put a pause on how much we're reading because it's no longer helpful. Mm -hmm. But um, usually the beginning phases of it are pretty, pretty important. Yeah, absolutely. They get you at least to find somebody that you're finally on the right path. And then maybe let's, you know, let up on the research. Yeah, exactly. Just learn to kind of lean into our body and body awareness. And then sometimes you need to go back to the research and you come back to your body. It's a dynamic process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to go back to the, diagno the diagnosis question you had earlier, um, I do want to kind of expand on that a, a bit from what you just said. Yeah, sometimes the diagnosis is helpful, like in the case of endometriosis, where they're not getting one, you need something because that's going to direct you to maybe the proper treatment approach. It can very much swing the other way. And I see this a lot with my patients with interstitial cystitis and vaginismus because when they get those diagnoses, you have these symptoms. I know these symptoms fit this box and this diagnosis. And in conventional medicine, they look at that and say, okay, well, if it's interstitial cystitis, then the treatment is Almiron and installations, which now we've really like made a big mistake. And so that's where I think, okay, let's talk about your symptoms. So it's, it, it, it depends on the symptoms, but I agree like from a healing standpoint, in many cases, the diagnosis is less important and more like, okay, so you're having these symptoms. How can we get you to do this function? And the diagnosis doesn't matter. So it can go both ways on that. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Absolutely. Yes. I'm curious, what are some things that you also work on with clients or, or, or want them to address kind of outside of the hour or so that you're with them? What are you looking for? Like family support or I hear the interdisciplinary part, like other doctors and other people involved. Um, does anything else tend to come up? Aside from all of that, that's all, I mean, of course, all important. Um, I would say 
a, a big focus of mine before just giving all this homework and here's your sheet of 10 exercises. No one's going to do that. So I stick to like two to three exercises. That makes sense and they'll change. But I really focus on the awareness piece because most people don't know that they have a pelvic floor or pelvic floor muscles. And so if we've never been taught that, our brain is not anywhere near there. And that's different than being like disassociated essentially from that area of pain because there's people that are are not, they can be in their bodies, they're okay with that, but still not recognize what is what. So I really, the first few appointments, I really try to hone in on awareness of what things feel like to kind of orient them to this new part of their body, which when you actually are aware of it, you can feel different sensations and then they start to make the connections for themselves. It makes everything better because then they start to know what's what. It's not just this one big blur. They also know, okay, when I have this, actually I might need to do this. Whereas when I feel this, this actually might be when I need to do X, Y, or Z, or I just need to, you know, it's not about stretching or foam rolling. It's more about, I just need to sit and take a few deep breaths and move on or whatever the instance is. And so I think the awareness piece is huge. And I don't know that everybody always focuses on that. Yeah, I think that's such an important part and also one of the hardest parts. You only have such limited time, depending on your clients, like, you know, work. Um, I think about this a lot with my own clients, like my job, like all I read about, all I learn about (laughs) is the mind. And I also do a lot of reading around the body just because I think it's important in in the niche that I work with. But Mm -hmm. um. If you're working like tech nine to five and then you're coming home and making dinner for your kids and you're and like you just don't have it's hard to like sit and read and learn what you need to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, And also, it's such an important part of bringing awareness. It's not just the body awareness like your brain and your body have to both be like on the same page. So it's hard, but it's important. Yeah. And that's why I like the awareness piece, because throughout their day, they're going to start to be more mindful of, oh, that's what she was talking about when she talked about the importance of posture. And so they bring it in in like little micro doses, but they're catching it because you're getting more to the like you're building that foundation. They're not just going through the routine of like, oh, I need to do this exercise or I need to sit up straight because they're they're making it meaningful to them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure even just a little bit of the education piece goes a long way like that. I still remember um, I had a dentist in like middle school and he was like, you grind your teeth like all day. And I was like, no, I don't. And he's like, well, now that I've said it, you'll probably be aware of it. And sure enough, <laughs> mm-hmm. I was like, okay, all day long, grinding my teeth. Yeah. And yeah. you're like, oh. Okay. And then they make their own connections and insights. And then they share that with you. And you're like, now I have better information. I have a new piece of the puzzle that I didn't have before because they just weren't aware of it. Exactly. This has been really good. What, um, anything else come to mind around, you know, either common things that you hear that are maybe misconceptions or myths or common things you feel like you really, really need to hone in on with your patients? So we'll talk about Kegels for a second first, because I, yeah. earlier at the beginning, we I talked about kind of these two groups of disorders, like these low tone weakness, high tone, maybe pain, tightness. Most things are a mix. And yes, please don't just do Kegels for everything. They can be a tool. They can be appropriate. But I also want to make sure that people that might have incontinence, you know, sometimes it's too tight, the muscle's not functioning, you optimize it, and then you're good to go. But I don't want people to get scared of contracting their pelvic floor if they have tightness or pain, because the reality is these muscles are on to some degree all the time, or else you'd be, you know, fluids would be coming out of your body, you wouldn't be able to stand up straight. So there's a difference of doing that three sets of 10 kegels five times a day versus naturally engaging those muscles to brace yourself and being mindful to relax fully after you do so, even if you have to do some Kegel type work. One one speaker that I listened to recently, he's a great, great speaker, Anthony Lowe, I believe he's Australian, and he did a course on pelvic organ prolapse. And 
I thought it was so funny because he's, you know, talking about how we approach these people as so delicate, like, don't do that. No, you're going to put too much pressure. And he's like, you know, your patient before that appointment was probably running around like a crazy person trying to get their kids in the car. They're grabbing everything just as they go. They're stressed out. All of that's creating more pressure in their pelvis. Like, it's going to be okay. <laughs> so I, I think that, that people need to realize both things are true. One, you probably don't need to be doing all these kegels. But two, it's actually probably pretty safe to engage your muscles and you don't have to be so careful. I think that's so important. Yeah. I think it's similar with people will be like, well, you, and now I'm, I'm even having like a hearing a lot of like therapists just talk so much about stress with their clients. And I'm like, we are totally able to adapt and handle stress. Stress is not inherently the problem. You don't have to fear stress. I think that just causes so much more issue to, to it all. Instead, we want to be able to, what do you need when you're stressed? How can you move through that heightened feeling, that heightened emotional state, and then come down from it naturally? So that's that's a big part of the work that I do with people too, because it's just the the fear around stress just drives me insane. Yeah, we're gonna have it. It's a yeah. normal part of life. Yes. And then awesome. the two other well, things I would I would say yeah, that, that you, in talking about the myths and conceptions, one, vaginal hormones are very safe and we have a lot of misinformation that even authors of the Women's Health Initiative have tried to come back and, and state, hey, we were wrong when we were seeing these adverse reactions coming through. They didn't, they hadn't analyzed the data appropriately. There was a lot of issues with how they ran the study. And so one of the biggest things when it comes to pelvic pain conditions, hormones play a huge role in so many of these, and they are safe. They are safe for the rest of your life, and it's different than systemic hormone therapy. So don't be scared of the vaginal hormones. And it's not about like rejuvenating your vagina or making things look great. It is about improving your symptoms for pain, for pain, for pain with intercourse, but it's also so important for our urinary health because when we get older, one of the most common causes of urinary tract infections essentially is that environment is not set up to protect you anymore, but we lose those same symptoms as we had when we were younger. And the first sign might be this altered state of like men uh, m mental health, essentially like, oh, okay, personality differences and boom, it's a kidney infection, then people die. So- <laughs> Vaginal estrogen is really important and it does not cause these crazy things that are being talked about. And there are organizations trying to get the black box warning label off because it's not relevant and that creates uh -huh. a lot of fear. So that's important. And then the third thing I'll just say, because we were mentioning the integrative health and, and nutrition, is that when it comes to food, honestly, you can have the best intention of working with a nutritionist or a dietitian that tells you to do an elimination diet or restrict. And that I would caution because one, these lists of foods, even if so appropriate, not every single one of them will be reactionary to you. But also there's with nutrition in our world and all of the marketing, you know, gluten-free, dairy-free, it's actually truly not healthier. And there's many ways to do that, but there's so much that's lacking in our diet that uh, how I work a lot of the time is let's figure out what your major triggers are that are known, but also let's start to include more foods that you can tolerate and get you in a good foundation and good nutrient status before taking all this stuff away because it is stressful. And sometimes you got away is the stress of doing the diet actually worth the benefits of doing the diet. And in many times it's not. So I would also just encourage, remember that we need to add stuff in, not just start with taking more away. I think that's so helpful and such an important thing to talk about and probably could be its own podcast on its own too. Even I had this thought earlier, I don't remember exactly what we were talking about, but I was just thinking about all the testing we have and how it helps us and and you know we can have advanced advanced notice of things that we wouldn't have had before but i also think a lot of our testing 
alerts us to maybe things that also could have resolved on their own or like like the body is dynamic it goes up and down it's not this perfect picture of health from the moment you're born to the moment you die and so as things go up and down if you're unaware of it and it was like a normal up and down now this test says oh you know you you caught you caught this thing early but what if it was never going to linearly grow Mm -hmm. um and so it's something i've been grappling with is like we need testing we need accurate testing we need quality testing but also how much does it sometimes also create just as many problems as what it solves yes i love that you said that because all testing is a tool yes there are certain things that can be screened that you may that truly may be asymptomatic and you kind of just keep monitoring but i think as a clinician if you understand what you're looking for you before ordering testing or doing testing you should have an idea of what you're looking for and that test just validates your hypothesis and that's how you utilize it because you're right i think it does create a lot of is if you're with a conventional doctor oh you're borderline this take this medication probably less so if you're in the natural wellness space but that's problematic too because now you have 50 supplements you have to take that just cost you two thousand dollars so, and you oh, may not have just needed that. Yes, yes. And, you know, not to detract from just the elimination stuff. I know I was actually really messed up from that um, and wish I had, had known a little bit more about keeping foods in. So, mm-hmm. again, yeah, that actually, that needs to be a whole other um, podcast episode. So we can talk a whole that. episode about dietary things and nutrition and all of that. Happy to. Awesome. Thank you so much. Is there anything you want to leave listeners with? And also where can they find you? So I am trying to be better about social media, uh, but I kind of go under our companies at Pelvic Health, which is Instagram. We do have a YouTube channel with a lot of good videos, information, um, Pelvic Health and Rehabilitation Center on YouTube. Um, TikTok is fun. We have some of our wonderful PTs who are very good about doing videos on there with a lot of education. We have a blog that we do. We have um, our my podcast, I Care Better Endometriosis Unplugged, which we're on hiatus. I don't know when you're putting this out there, but we will probably start back uh, sometime in January. Uh, but for more education around endometriosis, and I am at Pelvic Health SD on Instagram if people are interested in that. Um, my email is jandra at pelvicpainrehab.com. If that's helpful or you want to put that in the show notes, happy to share that. And I think just the most important thing is, you know, be you you have to be your own advocate and keep going. You know, listen to people, like listen to your intuition. And when you find somebody that kind of jives with you, like work with them, um, trust them that they are going to get you to the next step and they may not be able to solve everything, but they may be able to get you to that next step. But keep keep fighting if you don't feel like what you're being told fits and it's not addressing your concerns because the body is incredible and it's going to tell you what it needs. And with the right inputs, you can make those changes. Um, so just keep pushing and advocating for yourself if you're not getting the answers or help you need. Yeah, thank you so much. Don't put all of the, that information in the show notes. And um, yeah, this has been great. I appreciate you. Yeah, thank you for having me on and looking forward to maybe talking more. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for listening. If you learned something new today, consider writing it down in your phone notes or journal and make that new neural pathway light up. Better yet, I'd love to hear from you. Send me a DM on Instagram, email me, or leave a voice memo for us to play on the next show. The way you summarize your takeaways can be the perfect little soundbite that someone else might need. And lastly, leaving a review really helps others find this podcast, so please do if you found this episode helpful. And P.S. Clicking subscribe ensures you'll be here for the next episode. See you then.